Hi, it's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Welcome to another edition of Q&A with the Coach. Today we have a question from our friend Nerd King 81 because apparently there are a minimum of 80 other Nerd Kings out there on the internet. Who got that screen name first? He says, love your videos, Mr. Dewey. One question, though. When two partners of different skill levels are sparring and one, the junior student, asks the other to please go easier and the other partner, the senior student, if you will, gets defensive and, and begins to act like this is as light as they go. This is a very specific situation, it sounds like. Do you stop training with that person? Yes. Yes, you do. Or try to get through to them that they're going too hard and need to lighten up. As a follow-on, do you keep this information about your sparring partner to yourself, or do you report it to the class coach? Okay, if you are getting injured in sparring, step away from that situation. If you're getting brain damage in sparring, step away from that situation. If you've already asked your training partner repeated, repeatedly, go lighter, please, I'm getting injured, this is not a sustainable sparring rate for me, and they're still ramping it up, step away from there. Do you need to report that to your coach if you believe that person is a danger to <laughs> is a danger to you and to others in the class? Maybe have a talk with your coach about that. Maybe do it in private, though. Again, it's entirely possible that that person really is using the best of their ability to control their sparring. Not everybody is able to do that. Not everybody is able to spar at a very controlled level. It's, it's a very specific talent that takes time and attention to, to develop. So, yeah, that's my advice, my friend. If you're in a troubling situation in a sparring session, remove yourself from it. Next question. Our next question comes from Royal Flush. He says, do you think Chosun Ninja is legit? Chosun Ninja? Man, I remember him. From when YouTube was brand new, I think he had a MySpace page back in the day. Is he still making videos? Is he still on the internet? I, I honestly didn't know. Um, I remember watching some of his videos back in the day and, and they were like vlog style videos where he would talk about martial arts philosophy and things like that. I, I don't really know anything about the guy other than that. So, I don't know if you got any specific videos or techniques or whatever that, that you want me to take a look at. Sure, send me a link to that. And that, that applies to everything. I get a lot of, uh, a lot of questions from a lot of people. Like, like one guy in particular people always send me questions about is, is Nick Drosos. Um, he's got a self-defense channel, does a lot of self-defense related videos, and um, a lot of people with a very specific agenda against Nick Drosso send me requests saying, hey, do, wanna, do one of those um, bad women self-defense videos on Nick Drosso, and, and, and I ask them, well, can you send me a specific questionable video that, uh, that you are um, wondering about? And they never do. And, you know, I've, I've looked at his channel, and um, the dude has like, has like 800 videos, something like that, and I don't have the time in the day to sift through 800 videos looking for, looking for something that might be bad. I mean, if there's something big and glaring and, and, and horrible, man, and you want me to take a look at it, let me know with a very specific link. But... Um, Man, Nick, I've watched some of his videos and uh, and I find myself just kind of drifting off because it's um, it's a little bit boring. And that's that's not a slight on Nick Drosos. It's it's the fact that practical self defense concepts are kind of boring things. It's not big fancy cool spinning ninja moves or whatever. It's it's just basic common sense advice. You know, go don't go into that dark alley or or um, you know, have friends around you. Use simple, basic, combative techniques over over fancy ones. You know, and that's that's not something that um, is. How can I put this? Exciting or sexy or whatever. It's 
It's what the truth sounds like, man. So back to Chosun Ninja. Um, man, I remember back in the day, like back when YouTube was brand new, there was this guy who, who had kind of a big following. Um, and I'm blanking on his name, blanking on his name, uh, something to do with ninjas or shinobi or whatever. And he was a huge, huge fan of Chosun Ninja. And he, he would make all these, all these ninja videos and, and he was so passionate about it. And I love people who are passionate about stuff. I really do. You know, even, even if it's something that I'm not really into, like, um, music, for example, music is one of those things. There are so many styles of music, so many genres of music that I don't really care about. But when I hear music that is art, when there is artistry behind it, when, when I can feel that and, and perceive that artistry behind the music, regardless of the genre or the artist, I can appreciate that. So yeah, this, this dude, this, uh, this Chosun Ninja fan, he, he was just reamed by the internet, like, oh, you're a fake and your sensei is a fake or whatever. But, you know, I watched this guy and, and I saw his passion about ninjas and, uh, and he, he made all these, these videos of like ninja obstacle courses and they were actually pretty cool, man. They were actually really cool. Um, he ended up doing some cool parkour style stuff and, uh, and, you know, he parlayed his passion for ninjas into like some, some real life skill sets that, that were really, really cool to, to watch and, and to share and to learn from. So, you know, is Chosun Ninja a real ninja? No, nobody in this day and age is a real ninja, man. The whole ninja mythos has been greatly exaggerated. But, um... Is what he taught, his philosophy, whatever he was doing, is that legit? Man, it's, it's as legit as you make it out to be. If it gives you the result that you want, that's the right way. And if it doesn't, then it's not. So if you're getting something positive out of Chosun Ninja or whoever you're watching on YouTube that is pushing you in a positive direction, that is helping you to, to make this world a better place and to do something with your life that allows you to to go in the direction you want to go, then sure, that's legit. That's as legit as it gets, my friends. Next question. Our next question comes from Dirk Jones, who says, Ramsey, Dirk, hey man, what's up? Ramsey, how about a fast video on your reaction to the Ruiz win against Anthony Joshua? Yeah, that happened, didn't it? Whoa. He goes on to say, is it really worth training to look like Apollo when Homer Simpson can knock you out. And remember, that, remember that episode of The Simpsons where Homer became a boxer, but he didn't really know how to box, and he got tired throwing a single punch, and so Mo, his corner man slash bartender, told him to just stand there and take the punches until his opponent got tired. That's a terrible strategy, by the way. If you do that in a real boxing match, a good referee will call that match a TKO pretty quickly. You won't make it out of round one, even if you're not hurt. If you're not intelligently defending yourself, it's a TKO, a technical knockout. So defend yourself at all times. That's rule number one of combat sports, my friends. But okay, okay, I see where you're coming from, though. Uh, Anthony Joshua has a body like a Greek god. And Andy Ruiz has a little extra something around the middle. And we see a guy like that, and, and it plays tricks with our mind, because we're, we're conditioned to believe that a guy who looks like a Greek god should have no trouble beating a guy who has some fat around his midsection. I'm going to tell you that that's just simply objectively not true. I mean, there are so many examples, so many anecdotes of guys with some fat on them who are good fighters. Hmm. But I'm going to interrupt this train of thought to bring you this message. Andy Ruiz 
trains, my friends. That man trains. He puts in the work. If you want to, if you have the time, do a YouTube search for Andy Ruiz training. And what do you get? Hundreds of videos of that man putting in work in the gym, training to box, training for power, training for explosion, training for speed. He's no Homer Simpson, my friends. He's got a big body, but he's no Homer Simpson. So something about the way that question was worded. Um, is it really worth training to look like Apollo? You got to understand this. Combat sports are not about aesthetics. For a lot of people, if you train like a combat sports ath athlete, you're going to look good. You're going to look better. Your body is going to look a little bit more like the Greek god and a little bit less like Santa Claus. But that's not always the case. That's not always the case. Um, I watched a video uh, a while back from, from our friend Sergio at uh, Practical Combat um, Martial Arts where he was, he was venting some frustration because uh, uh, some antagonistic comments on his videos were calling him fat, saying, how can you, how can you claim to be a, a kung fu expert or whatever? Or a martial artist, if if you have if you have the extra pounds around your midsection, and he made a video response to that where he showed himself working out and and uh, you know displaying agility and and uh, strength and flexibility and and his and certain martial arts skills, and he said, "Look, I know I'm heavier than you would expect, but look, I can move, I can do these things. I'm still an athlete." So, you know, there are tons of guys like that out there. And I, I see this all the time in, in China. If you look at heavyweight fights in China, the Chinese heavyweights tend to look a lot more like Andy Ruiz and a lot less like uh, Greek gods, you know. There, there's just something about uh, Chinese culture in particular where... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? The word fat is used differently in Chinese. It really is. You'll see like little skinny, skinny twig-like girls calling themselves fat. And at first, when, when I heard this, I thought they were anorexic. And I'm not entirely ruling that out. But, uh, but when they say fat, it's kind of the antithesis of strong. But when they say strong, when they, when they say muscle or muscular in in Chinese, they're not talking necessarily about a guy who looks like a bodybuilder with all the striations on his body. In fact, they'll often call these guys who, by American standards, we would, we would just call them fat. They'll say, he's so strong, he's so muscular. Because they're used to heavyweight athletes who look more like sumo wrestlers and less like bodybuilders. I refereed a, a match... Um, a while back, an MMA fight uh, between um, my friend Rob. Um, go check out the podcast I did with him, Robert Sothman. He's one of those guys who's, who's got this chiseled physique. He's strong, he's tough, and he looks the part. He's got, you know, the six-pack abs and all this. And uh, he was fighting this Chinese dude, a heavyweight, who looked fat. And when people saw the two fighters weighing in, you know, if they were placing bets, those bets were on Rob immediately, without question. Now, Rob won that fight. But the audience was shocked. They were shocked at the level of skill and the lack of skill disparity between the two fighters. They were shocked that Rob didn't just bulldoze the guy with some extra pounds around him. It took some work. It took a few rounds. To win that decision because the fight went went the distance and people were shocked like what a fat guy can fight for 15 minutes straight no way now when you see a combat sports athlete who has some fat on him please do not take that as license to not exercise i mean watch these guys how they train they exercise again go look up andy ruiz training montages or you know training videos of any type 
and you'll see some inspiring sequences of training. Again, that man puts in the work. You don't get that fast. And he's fast, man. He's got, he's got fast hands. You don't get that without work. You can't just sit on the couch and do a Homer Simpson and expect to perform like that in the ring. I had a question from... One of our friends who sent me an email about, about strength training for combat sports, and I gave him a list of the most important lifts for combat sports, the squat, the deadlift, and the pull-up, which in my opinion, especially if you're pressed for time, that's the most bang for your buck. It will give you the greatest returns in strength. And he said, okay, okay, but, but what, about, uh, what about my triceps? What exercise can I do for this muscle and this muscle and this muscle? Because he wanted to, he wanted to look like a bodybuilder. And I asked him, are you asking me this because you are worried about winning fights or about aesthetics? His response was, well, honestly, I'm, it's kind of 50-50. <laughs> I'm, I want to look aesthetic and I want to win fights. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think... You know, every man on earth just about would rather look a little bit more like Anthony Joshua than, than Andy Ruiz. Just putting that pull out there. Aesthetically, we, we want to look like the bodybuilder. We want to look like the iconic figure. But that's... Uh, hmm. That's not, uh, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing in the fight game is that at the end of that fight, you have, you're the one with your hand raised. So, that's where the get out there and train comes in. Next question. Our next question comes from Surfside, who says, If it takes years of training to be proficient then why try to get a blue belt in BJJ since 90% of students stop training once they get to that level? I'd appreciate any intelligent replies. Okay. Huh. I'm trying to understand this question. It's, it's a, um, a post hoc ergo propter hoc statement. That's Latin for because of this, therefore this. It's like an algebra equation. If X equals whatever, then whatever. So let me try to figure out this mathematics in my head. If it takes years of training to be proficient, then why try to get a blue belt in BJJ since 90% of students stop training? Okay. Generally speaking, it takes years of training to get a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So if it takes years of training to be proficient, then why spend years of training to be proficient. A blue belt in BJJ basically means you are a fairly proficient grappler. A legitimate blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in a contest of grappling should be able to beat a fairly significant percentage of the human population You've got to develop a certain level of proficiency to earn a blue belt. And again, generally speaking, it takes, it's going to take a few years. Hmm. So I don't really understand this question very much. I've heard some statistics. Let's talk about this. 90% of students top, stop training once they get to that level. I'm not sure where that statistic comes from or, or if that's accurate, but let's just assume it is. Let's just assume that 90% of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu students stop training once they earn a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. If it takes years of training to be proficient, then why try to get... Okay. Why try to get a belt? Let's not even quantify or qualify the color or the rank. Why try to get a belt? If it takes years of training to be proficient in martial arts, 
then spend years of training in martial arts. If your goal is proficiency, then work at that every day. If your goal is to chase after a belt, or a rank, or a sash, or a ribbon, or a medal, or a fancy golden star to pin on your shirt, then that is what you're going to get at the end of the day. We will not achieve anything beyond our goals, my friends. So if your goal is proficiency in martial arts, then practice martial arts. If your goal is a trophy, then you're going to get a trophy. Do you see the difference? Next question. Our next question comes from Pete P, who says, Hey, Ramsey, are you part of the LDS or the RLDS church? And what's your opinion on RLDS? Or, or if you have an opinion that is just curious, because I've only found out uh, recently that there are more than one group of Mormons. Okay, uh, I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You might say the LDS church, sometimes called the Mormons. There is a group, uh, I don't know if they're still card, called the RLDS Church. I, I think I heard that they had changed their name at some point. But there was a group called the RLDS, or Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that broke off um, a long time ago from, from the original Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they have a, a different set of beliefs. And, and yeah, it's not affiliated with... Uh, with the LDS church, but um, there are actually a lot of Mormon splinter groups out there, man. A lot of them. A lot of people who had uh, fundamental disagreements with, with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and broke off and started to do their own thing, and, and they go by all kinds of different names. Um, here's, a, here's a weird story. Weird and interesting, and, and you can't make this stuff up, man. So... I get a lot of uh, requests from people saying, hey, can you show videos of, of some of your old fights? And I only have a few short video clips of, of my professional fights with a few exceptions, uh, especially the old ones. Now, the first professional MMA show that I fought in was this one that took place in Salt Lake City, Utah, called The Ultimate Combat Experience. And I remember... I had this really bad fight. Uh, I lost a fight to this guy named Brian Perrin, who was just the just the better fighter that day, and and he took full mount and dropped some elbows and finished with a TKO, and it was kind of an embarrassing, one-sided loss. And I I remember um, thinking like, oh man, oh if if you searched my name on YouTube, that was one of the first things that came up. And you can't find that fight on YouTube anymore. You can't find any of those old Ultima Combat experience fights on YouTube anymore. Not, not the ones I'm, I'm, I was in anyway. But you used to be able to. And here's the story of why. And this all goes back to Mormon splinter groups. Um, man, I hope I have time to finish this story because i got to go pick up my kids from school in a bit. So, one day... Out of curiosity, I started, uh, I searched my own name on YouTube to try to see if, if that fight was still at the top of the list. And it wasn't. Instead, <laughs> instead I got this, this video result from this dude named Christopher Namelka, who is this Mormon splinter group leader. And he was calling me out. It was like, Ramsey, I challenge you. I was like, who is this guy? I've never heard of him. And Christopher Namelka has some, in my estimation, crazy beliefs. Um, a lot of people think that, uh, that the beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are pretty out there. And, and uh, you know, Christopher Namelka takes it to the next level. Next level, man. So, uh... I watched this video and he's like, I challenge you to basically like this, this doctrinal fight over the, uh, over some passage of the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. I'm like, what? 
how does this guy even know who I am? Why would he think I am even interested in engaging with him in a scripture bashing fight? And so I start researching this guy to figure out who he is. And um, basically he, he believes that he is a reincarnation of the brother of Joseph Smith, you know, the, the first um, leader of, of the, uh, the LDS church, basically. A reincarnation of Joseph Smith's brother come back to restore the church to its its true path or whatever, something like that. And um, yeah, he's I, I don't want to rip on him too much, but you know, he's got some some pretty out there ideas. And I'm like, what is the connection here? What is the connection? Because again, this was the first video that came up when you search for my name. It, I haven't been able to find it. Uh, he must have taken it down. But for a, for a long time, this this was it. When you searched Ramsey Dewey on YouTube or Google, so I started doing some digging, and uh, and the guy who who took the videos for the Ultimate Combat Experience, um, I guess he had some kind of dispute with with the the owner of of the the promoter of the event. And um, he took all the videos, like all the videos, took them down off of YouTube, took like the archive footage and, 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 and left with it. And there was a big dispute and some lawsuits and so on regarding that. And he joined Christopher Namelka's group, joined the cult, man. And both of these guys were, are actually good friends of mine. So I, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to name drop them or, or uh, say anything negative about them because I know there's a lot of bad blood between those two, but uh, yeah, he joins Namelka's group and and all those videos disappear and instead we've got this this uh, this wacky cult leader um, <laughs> calling me out to a scripture fight or something like that, to a Bible bashing session. You can't make this stuff up, man. You can't make this stuff up. And I... I sent him a couple of messages like, who the heck are you, man? What is going on? But then I found out that my, uh, my dad knew this guy. And my dad has his own splinter group. He, he, um, my dad, he left the, uh, the LDS church a long time ago, long time ago, like before, before I was born. And, and, uh, he, he started his own thing and he's got his own set of beliefs and all that. And, and apparently a long time ago, he and Christopher Demelka had this like, I don't know, some sort of Bible bashing rift between them and, and they, they were not on good terms. And so in order to like get back in my dad, Nemelka's like calling me out and, and like somehow, somehow all of this MMA fight footage gets lost in the mix. It's confusing. But yeah, there are a lot of Mormon splinter groups out there, and it's weird, man. It's weird. Um, Brigham Young, he was the, the second president of the Church of, of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He said something which I think is amazing, especially when you learn about all these Mormon splinter groups, which is you can leave the church, but you can't leave it alone. <laughs> And the more I see these guys who, who leave the church, it's so true, man. These, these guys who just get like bitter and jaded and, and weird about it. I, it, it's weird because I know a lot, of, um, a lot of people who, you know, used to be Catholic or whatever, or used to be, go to some Protestant church because their, their parents made them do it. And, and they, they decided, ah, that, I'm not into that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an atheist. I don't believe that, any of that or whatever. And... They never bring up religion. It's, it's just not part of their lives. But, man, these Mormon splinter guys, they cannot leave it alone. It's like they've got to... They've got to develop this... This narrative that is so much... So out there, so far beyond... <sighs> Now, let's talk about the word cult for a minute. I, I got a question from uh, another subscriber, and I don't think it was intention to be mean, but he basically said um, something along the lines of, hey, Ramsey, 
um, I notice sometimes you talk about martial arts cults. And he said, isn't that a bit of hypocrisy because you belong to the Mormon cult? And here's the thing. All churches are cults. If, if you look up the definition of that word cult, here, let's, let's read that right now. Cult, a system of religious veneration or devotion directed towards a particular figure or object. So according to that definition, every church is a cult. In fact, um, in, the word, in Spanish, the word culto, which means cult, it doesn't have the negative semantic connotation that it does in English. In English, we say cult and we think of like, ooh, ooh, it's this, this scary deal led by a charismatic sociopath. But in Spanish, it's just a church. It's just, you know, a group that gets together to worship something. So technically, every, every church is a cult, and that's, that's fine to say. It's fine to say. My church is the cult of Jesus. Why? Because we go to church to worship Jesus. And I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. It's just how language works. But the difference between that and martial arts, martial arts are not religions, at least they shouldn't be religions. Martial arts are systems of combat. They are fighting methods. It's codified systems of combat that you use to win fights. And if you are worshipping a guy or an object, that's not a martial art. That's a cult. If you take a look at, um, let, let, let's look at a video right here. So we've got a group of martial artists and, well, supposedly martial artists, martial cultists. And they're all gathered around and they're worshipping this guy, the cult leader. You can see they're, they're moving when he wants them to move. Not because they are imposed upon by a supernatural power, but rather through the power of suggestion from the central figure that they are worshipping and venerating. So this group is the cult of that guy. It's the cult of their grandmaster or sensei or whatever. So, see the difference? Martial arts, systems of combat, cults, groups of worship. Next question. All right, this last one, it's not a question, it's, it's a statement, but I want to read it. It's from our friend Adriano who says, I hated you at first, but over time listening to your, to your videos, I agree with, with most of your vids. I'm a big fan now. Keep up the good work. And th th this is interesting to me. I've, I've actually heard this quite a bit over the last few months. People who basically wrote me um, messages saying, I used to hate you when I first watched your video. I was like, oh, who, who does this guy think he is? I hate this guy and his stupid bald head. And they wrote me angry comments and some of them came, came around and they apologized. I'm, I'm sorry I said that. Man, you, you're, you were right. And um, the, the reason I bring this up, I, I want to I express this very specific message. Um, that it's very important when we hear negative criticism to assume the best about people to assume this person criticizing us is not some demonic evil doer who needs to be straightened out they're a person just like you expressing frustrations just like you and you have to give people the benefit of the doubt that they are just like you And when you're able to do that, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, those people can come around and see your point of view just like you. That's a fancy way of saying, don't type angry comments back. Stop and think for a minute before you think about retaliating. Anyway, that's the public service announcement for today. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train.